My name is Average Joe, and I'm a proud geek with expertise in movies, superheroes, and animation. And my name is Pixel Patch. I'm a joyful geek with an expertise in gaming, both tabletop and video. Our mission is to bring nerd culture to the masses. And by sticking it all under the microscope. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Bat Jar Podcast. Podcast. Movies, TV, manga, comic books, or is that graphic novels, cartoons, groups, that's animation, Disney, Star Wars, Dragon Ball Z, Pokemon, Pokemon, and Digimon, and Mighty Morphin, Power Rangers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Yo Gi Oh! and Nintendo, Cinematic Universe, Marvel, DC, Justice League, is Batman, Jesus, Superman, Flash, Wonder Woman, Avengers, Iron Man, Captain Charles, Loki, Spider Man, and Hulk, and Logan, X Men, Thunder, Zeppelin, Galaxy, Guardian, Star Trek, Trick, Trick, Card, and Jane, Guns and Geese, Come Gather, Rapping, Jordan, and Jane, the Big Bad Shark, Fiber, Joe, and Pixel. Hello there, and welcome to the Batchar Podcast, where we put nerd culture under the microscope. And we just scrape it along, you know, collect all the little bits of nerd culture and pour it out from a puppet. And uh, yeah. Yeah, today we're bringing out an old sample, if you will. We're talking about Ooh, a, like a property, a film that is actually, at the time of this recording, 19 years old. Which makes me feel super old. It's a 2000s film, you know, when Godzilla came out and the Y2K was happening. Like, I hate to disappoint you, but Godzilla, the one with Matthew Broderick, came out in 1998. Dang. Okay, I need to leave. <laughs> no, I will. Please stay. <laughs> Please stay. We need a second person. <laughs> No, no, got to go. I, I just, I got my years wrong. That's it. I, I blame my uh, lack of ability to, to, to tell years on being French <laughs> because uh, it's really weird because in French, yesterday can mean like a week ago, a month ago. And I'm just like, yeah, that happened about like a month ago because I don't use, I don't use that often enough. And they're like, no, that was like eight months ago. I was like, wow, man, I'm just really bad at this. <laughs> Well, we're not going to talk about the news today because we're recording this ahead of time. As I mentioned last week, I'm, I'll am i be in the middle of an eight-day retreat when this episode goes out. So if we were to talk about news stories, they'd be like so out of date. People would be like, yeah, that, that was like that, that was, was forever so, ago. Hey, yeah, did like, you hear that Mario Kart's coming to mobile? Hey, did is, you know is that? Is it actually happening? Yeah, that's actually oh. happening. Yeah, that's kind of fun stuff. Do not know that. So, <laughs> so yeah, so we're not going to talk about any news stories and hopefully that you guys will be okay with that. Let's give us more time to talk about our feature conversation, which is going to be about the film Unbreakable. If it's our feature conversation, so we have a large, heavy voice saying, coming soon to Helms near you. You know, there's not many movie trailers like that anymore. With You, know, you ever notice there's not many like trailer guy voices anymore? It's mm. mostly just words on screen. In a world. Yeah, there's not much of that yeah, anymore. Yeah, I, I kind of miss it. I, I do miss that. Okay. Um, but I don't really notice it, so I guess we're good. So why are we talking about Unbreakable now? Why, did, why are we circumventing the rules of the podcast and instead of just putting it in the bat jar and you know talking about it whenever it comes out why are we breaking the rules and talking about it now do you know why pixel i do know why for once i know a thing (laughs) (laughs) uh so uh a year ago or maybe it was two years ago you guys may have heard of a, a james mcavoy film there you go got the last name right uh where he had split personalities what I never went to see it because it just seemed like a weird thriller horror movie and I just wasn't into it. But what I found out uh, because of the movie that we're going to be speaking about at some point, it's actually part of a trilogy that started with Bruce Willis starring as a superhero in a movie called Unbreakable. So the third movie in that series, Glass, uh, named after the titular bad guy in Unbreakable, uh, actually ties all three of these into kind of like a this side superhero but also very close to our own world series yeah so by the time that this episode goes out for you guys to listen glass will have just opened in theaters we have no information because this is in the past if this is the number one movie the box office or not but it's really the first comic book related release i guess you could say of 2019 Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's not directly adapted from a comic book but it is as we're going to discuss with talking about unbreakable it is very much inspired and rooted in comic book characters comic book lore Mm -hmm. comic book history and the original came at a time right before the big revamp of comic book movies so it was really a, a a very interesting movie like if nothing else yeah so let's talk about that so i first heard about unbreakable I want to say it was like 2014. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, many, yeah. many years after it had come out. Uh, I was following a YouTuber at the time called The Blockbuster Buster, mm-hmm. a guy who reviewed bad blockbuster movies, and he chose to kind of take a break from ripping on movies to highlighting a good one, and so he did an episode on Unbreakable, and specifically 
from what I recall, because I haven't watched this video in many, many years, but I remember him talking about Samuel L. Jackson's character, uh, Mr. Glass. Nice. And, and he was a very interesting character. Yeah. And so for whatever reason, that video was not entertaining enough for me to actually go and watch the movie. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, that's interesting. And that's kind of like all I knew about this franchise until when until two years ago when Split came out. And, you know, all the buzz that weekend was about how the movie had this twist ending. And the movie, all these movies we're talking about are directed by M. Night Shyamalan, Mm -hmm. a film director who is kind of famous for throwing twist endings into his movies. Yeah. So like you, I saw the trailers for Split and just thought, oh, this is some weird psychological horror movie that I'm just not into. So I had no desire to see it. But one of my regular podcasts was doing a review of the movie. So I was like, all right, whatever. I'll listen to what they have to say. Nice. And they explain the twist of Split is that it is. All right, wait, wait. Close your ears for like 10 seconds if you really want to go see Split. Okay, go ahead. That indeed Bruce Willis's character from this older movie called Unbreakable shows up at the end, which essentially establishes that indeed this random movie that is just happened to be directed by the same person is set in the same world as a movie he directed many years earlier. Not only in the same world, but in the same pretty much nearby area, like uh, in terms of like America, like okay. superhero America kind of thing. Um, so I was all of a sudden like, oh, like, okay, th- I've heard of this movie Unbreakable before, and now it's bring brought up, being brought up again in connection to this other movie. And that wasn't enough to get me to watch Split because I'm like, well, I still don't, I still haven't seen, <laughs> I still haven't seen the first one. So why should I care that there's now like a second one that's connected to? If it goes on Netflix, I'll watch the last 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I've seen the Split. We're but good. that part of my brain that loves continuity did kind of like peak up an interest said, oh, this is interesting. Like they're building a shared universe. And it was interesting too because Unbreakable was released by a subsidiary of Disney. Okay. But then Split was released by Universal. So oh, it was, okay. It was an interesting situation where I guess the director had enough creative control that he could basically carry his his characters and his storyline over to a different studio. Which is something you don't really hear about. No, that often. you don't. Usually, you usually if directors are just doing different movies, you don't assume they're part of the same continuity. But this seems to have worked because, like, I'm way more interested now knowing that it's a continuity than I would have been had they just released it. Yeah, and then later in 2017, they announced that they were going to do a new movie. That was going to be essentially bringing the world of Unbreakable, the characters from that movie, into the same world as the characters from Split. Mm -hmm. And that it was going to be basically like turning these movies that seemingly were unconnected to each other into a trilogy. Nice. And so that movie is upon us now, Glass. It's now in theaters. And since I'm in a retreat house somewhere while the movie is playing in theaters... We figured the closest thing we could do is introduce people to the first film in this series, mm-hmm. which, again, we are going to review Glass at some point in the coming week. So if you're wondering, well, aren't you, are you, you, know, you going to talk about it? Yes, we will talk about it. Mm-hmm. But for right now, this is all we can do. So for, for you, uh, Pixel, how did you first encounter Unbreakable? Uh, so I was 12 at the time, and my parents had rented this like pseudo superhero movie, I guess hoping at the same time that it wouldn't have too much inappropriate content. Uh, you know, they had their hand on the fast forward button, as, as you do. Uh, and it was an amazing movie because before, um, you know, lower budget uh, superhero TV series had come out, there was nothing in the pseudo superhero universe. Like you were either a su- overpowered superhero, like in the cartoons, or you were a nobody and you were just kind of doing your thing like an action hero. Like there was nothing in between. Whereas with Unbreakable, it's just this really interesting story that feels like the marriage between like the the um, unwilling 90s action hero, like, you know, he doesn't have everything all together. And the, the superhero series that you find a lot on TV, like Arrow, nowadays like this was the first time i had ever encountered anything and it was really cool because it was m night Shyamalan directing like a pseudo uh superhero film uh very very different and some really fun characters and some really good twists uh it's it's an enjoyable movie it's a, a coming of age not coming of age but coming of power i guess movie with bruce willis and it's unlike anything i'd ever seen at the time and you've seen the movie many times over the years? Uh, probably four or five times, yeah. Okay. So I watched it for the first time this past Friday, and it was a very eerie experience. Yeah. Because where we live in Ottawa, that same day there was a major bus accident. 
Oh, so you watched it on that day. I watched it on the day of the bus accident. So the, this is like basically a lot of this film involves the fallout from major traffic accidents, major mm-hmm. vehicle, train, plane, um, automobile accidents. And so it was very eerie to be watching a movie that, of course, I had no idea what the plot of the, I, I had planned to watch the movie in preparation for this podcast. Right. So it was very eerie to like have had that experience of just experience. Like I wasn't there at mm-hmm. the bus crash in Ottawa, but obviously I'm following the, the stories like everybody else. And to see a film that basically like goes through <laughs> like the crash aftermath. of of tons of like major accidents and stuff like the main one of the main focuses of the movie uh, as to why they happen. Like it, it's it, that must have been amazing. So what was your uh, like feeling on the movie? Like not going into the details, I was like, what did you think of your initial like reaction to the movie having that happen? Well, I feel like I have a stronger emotional reaction to the movie because of the real world situation I was living mm-hmm. that day. And I, you know, like a lot of things that I had no exposure to prior to starting this podcast, it was another instance of, okay, here's this thing that I've heard nothing but good things about. And now I'm finally dedicating the time to sitting down and, and watching said thing. Mm-hmm. And I got to say, it was pretty good. Good. Nice. <laughs> um, just before we get into like more of the story. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, more. I just wanted that like initial reaction. Okay, yeah. Cool. So, again, why are we talking about this movie now? Because it has gained my attention. It has it has gained the attention of a lot of people, I would say, because of the fact that M. Night Shyamalan decided to... I have no idea how far back he was planning to do this. But, but that's 19 years of tying a movie in together. It feels like... like seven for me but like you know it feels like i saw that movie when i was like 18 or 19 well, but like I, and unbreakable isn't really like well, the way movie ends it isn't really set up sequels like that was that was back before movies were trying to set up sequels all mm-hmm. the time so i'm sure for the people who enjoyed unbreakable it was really a huge like surprise to find out that oh like it's it, it, it still exists in a way it's well still- for me who hasn't seen it in like 20 years i was super excited like I wasn't as excited that they brought in McAvoy's character, but another showdown between Mr. Glass and and Bruce Willis, like super, super cool. Okay, fair enough. So when this movie came out, it didn't do very well by any stretch of the imagination. It Mm. only, it has a 69% on Rotten Tomatoes for Mm. critics. So better than Transformers movies. Except Bumblebee. (laughs) Yeah. And box office wise, it only made $95 million. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, I say only made $95 million. Uh, you know, that's obviously money that was made in the year 2000. So I'm sure if you adjusted that for inflation, it would, you know, look like more now. And it's a Shyamalan movie. So from what I remember, the uh, the budget wasn't like through the roof. They had some pretty straightforward stuff. I mean, it was $75 million. That's, oh, that's, wow. not, that's not cheap. Okay. Wow. Jeez. More money than I thought. I would have thought of a $40 million budget, but nope. I'm wrong. Yeah. And at this point, M. Night Shyamalan had done The Sixth Sense, which was really like his big, big, like, oh, this is an amazing movie. Everyone has to see it. This director is amazing experience. So he was he was a big name. And I think at that point, Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson were both big names. So you, you would think it had brought in more. Yeah. yeah. But apparently you have to remember that time period. Right. So this is the year 2000. It came out in November near the end of the year. The first X-Men movie had just come out. That summer. And so people were way more interested in seeing a real superhero movie for the first time than a... Well, people weren't interested in superhero movies at all. Oh, right. Like, this is like what's often referred to as like the dark time of superhero movies where Batman and Robin had come out and and Steel had come out with and, Shaquille O'Neal. And, and no one was interested. Yeah. And Blade had, Blade had come out and kind of like reestablished like, yeah, you can tell different types of stories about comic book characters and mm-hmm. they can be good films. But yeah, this was really a time when... The and it sounds weird, like here we're talking about 2019, all the comic book films coming out. But at this time, nobody wanted to see a comic book movie. It was just not the thing people were interested in. So the studio decided to market the movie as a psychological thriller. Interesting. Which is which was not what M Night Shyamalan wanted at all. He wanted to, like he was intending with this film to do something that was an homage and uh, uh, you know a superhero t- style story. So I imagine that people who he would have wanted to reach with the marketing of the movie weren't reached because of the fact that it was marketed a different way. Yeah. And so people who would have enjoyed the homage would have known more like uh, one of the characters works in a comic book shop and there are regular interactions in this comic book shop and the discussion of, you know, the morality of comics that 
I'm pretty sure real comic book readers would love. Like, yeah. but it once again did not reach that audience. And I feel like it reminds me of Firefly because we talked about how in the advertising for Firefly they kind of marketed it as more of like a shoot 'em up action series, right? Than what it actually was. So you basically you brought in the the wrong audience tuned in, and the people who should have tuned in didn't tune in because they were turned off by the marketing. Yeah. So I feel like that might have impacted Unbreakable's uh, performance, not just with the critics, but also obviously at the box office. Because again, people who are interested in this. Would have might have not gone to see it, mm-hmm. and I, I saw one article today. It basically suggested that that it was really that Unbreakable was the first postmodern comic book film. Interesting, and it was saying basically that it was really trailblazing the way for uh, this era of superhero movies that was more reflective, more introspective, more. Uh, passing commentary on the genre and on the story and like that's the feeling that i had of it like it feels a lot like the tv series this superhero tv series we have nowadays that's really uh close to the feel of it Uh, or at least what they try to capture in the first few episodes of a lot of series i've seen yeah because all right let's just let's just get into this now so what's your synopsis for us What, what do you think the story was so uh unbreakable is the story of this you know not ex cop, but this uh, of Bruce Willis. We're just going to call him. Bruce His Willis. name's David Dunn. All right, give fine. Him a, Dave, David name. Dunn. Why are you looking at me like that? One, because it seems you are the only survivor of this train wreck, and two, you don't have a scratch on you. I've come to believe a rather unbelievable possibility. I hope you can keep an open mind. Unbreakable. And Very comic book name, double initials. Yeah, you know, the classics. And he's just having some trouble with his uh, marriage, you know, like going in between the kids and stuff. And so he's been holding down the same job forever. And then he's part of this insane bus crash, this insane train crash, sorry, in which he is the only survivor. And so as time goes on, he's just unraveling what happened to him. How is he the only man still alive from this crazy accident? And he encounter someone who slowly teaches them that maybe just maybe he may be more than what he thought and as he unravels that he finds out that he has these powers that just aren't apparent because you wouldn't think about it like you know he never got sick he's never tried to lift anything super heavy and suddenly he actually tries it and succeeds like it's the idea of not knowing to try your boundaries because you wouldn't think of it and then suddenly he realizes that he can push past these boundaries that he hadn't even thought about. This movie, again, I'm I'm watching it now in 2019 with the eyes of a 2019 moviegoer. So I'm I'm accustomed to like Infinity War, where basically you can show all the superheroes in their costumes doing all these fantastical things, and it's just accepted and everyone loves it. I'm very curious about your angle on this as a new viewer from an old movie. Well, and, and so. It's, Again, like trying to understand like the time in which it was made. Like, yeah, that was the year that X Men movie came out. Where generally the only moment where they're suited up in costumes is at the end, and they're all wearing black leather. <laughs> um, and there's much more focus on like the characters and the and the the reality of being different as opposed to the the conflicts that they're you know getting themselves caught up in. So mm-hmm. it did feel a bit slow. I know that's evocative of M Night Shyamalan's directing, and I know that you know. Movies that have slower paces are generally like that. And I guess because so many of the movies I watch now are like big. We, we are going to give you coffee and then an adrenaline shot to the chest. And we hope that you survive. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, the movie felt slow, but I know like I, I know that it's not the film's fault. It's slow. It's intentionally done that way. Mm-hmm. And it makes, it makes you, it lets you just sit and think and feel uh, what the characters are going through, what the story is, is it is being presented to you. It's just not what I'm used to at right. this point. Like I'm used to seeing many more movies where like things are happening all the time. Or like The Quiet Place where they, they were literally jumping from one uh, crisis to the next at very quick speeds over the like hour and a half that it's playing. Whereas this one, it's like there's not always problems. He's just kind of like, huh, this is interesting. Well, all right, let's 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 do that. Yeah, people call this a superhero movie and I, I, I have a hard time calling it a superhero movie. Like, yes, I can totally see how it's inspired by superhero mm-hmm. comics and how it basically tries to ask the question of like what what if uh, an ordinary guy in the real world living in Philadelphia all of a sudden started demonstrating superpowers mm-hmm. well that's why I call it like a pseudo hero story like like it's 
almost there and it's definitely meant to be but it doesn't hit all the the classic points that, that you would expect so it's it's definitely a pseudo hero movie but it's maybe not a superhero movie yeah and some of the best superhero movies out there do a good job of basically blending the fantastic with the ordinary like mm-hmm. the incredibles like if you have a little bit of truth in there it helps sell the the fantastic yeah and like some of the best spider-man stories are related to him just trying to live ordinary life mm-hmm or uh, being stuck to a hobo and flying through the streets. Yeah. <laughs> um, Do you ever see the movie Chronicle? No. What was that one about? This was a movie with uh, Michael B. Jordan, Dane DeHaan. It came out in like 2012. And it was basically about these like three teenagers that find this meteorite. And it essentially it, start, it gives them all like telekinetic powers. Oh, interesting. So the whole movie is like a found footage film. And a lot of it is like the, the one character's camcorders being hovered in the air, like watching them do stuff. And it escalates into like a big battle at the end. But it is essentially about ordinary people gaining superpowers and then then like dealing with that in their reality. Did it have like a, a similar feel or well, because it's found footage, it probably has a very different feel to this movie, but well, I would so I compare it to Chronicle because I would say Chronicle, it's trying to evoke the, the themes of a superhero story, like mm-hmm. someone gaining incredible power, uh, except it, it kind of like makes it seem as though the option to like put on a costume and fight crime is not even is like not available to you. Right. It's like okay, we have to be realistic about this. So I'm going to approach my daily life the same as I have up until now, except all of a sudden now I have these enhancements. That and I have to before. deal with that. Okay, interesting. And if you haven't seen Chronicle, I would highly recommend it. it's a great movie. I probably will. Uh, it's, v- it's very visually interesting as well. Ooh. Yeah, because I I like found footage films if they're not horror movies <laughs> like Blair Witch. I would never watch. Yeah. Uh, but nah, cool. There's also like a whole genre of anime now that is essentially about people with superhuman powers that are either private investigators or they're part of spy organizations there is or, one i would highly recommend to you it's a uh, bungu stray dogs yes th- yeah that, that kind of story that one yeah no that they've been way more uh way more popular recently but like bungu did it amazingly well highly recommend yeah, it. a classic of that genre would be like Durarara. yep oh yeah 100 percent. where at for season one pretty much 90 percent of it you're not sure if certain people have powers or not you're like that just seems weird are are you are you super powered? Yeah, and that's the, so like I compare Unbreakable to those types of shows and mm-hmm. movies because they're essentially it's about normal people or seemingly normal people who happen to have superhuman abilities. Right. And so it just it go, it just tells an an ordinary story except all of a sudden the characters are enhanced in some way. Yeah. Having said all of that, I can also totally see how this is considered a superhero movie because literally the film opens with I mean, this isn't really a spoiler. It opens with this like page of text describing like the average number of comic books a collector owns and, mm-hmm. and emphasizes uh, comic books all throughout the movie. And you know what? Like the characters dress like comic book characters. Yep. No, there's definitely moments where I was just like, oh, that's technically an, a uniform. That's technically a suit. It uh, they, they do have a, a visual. See, it's funny because. They, you focused on the visuals of the characters, whereas one of the characters talks about the visuals of comic books in one of the scenes. They're like, see here how the villain's head is bigger and how it has this like evil grimace on its face. Uh, you know, they would use the visuals of a comic book to portray the moral truths behind it, whereas in the movie they're using the visuals of the characters to portray, you know, their moral standpoint that eventually lead to like, you know, people are dressed the way that you would expect them to behave. Yeah. And when we talked about Aquaman, I mentioned how I actually noticed the camera. Like I noticed the cinematography being done. Mm-hmm. This was in their movie where I really noticed that like there's scenes where they like the camera's just kind of going back and forth. You know, like there's a scene on the train where, you know, the camera is basically in the row in front of David. And it's, kind of doing the shift like left and right. Yeah, so you only see part of either him or the person he's talking to. And again, that represents paneling on comic books where basically it's like moving, you only see one static image at a time. Yeah. As a fan of comic books, I do, re- I, I received your love letter and my Shyamalan. I see how you were trying, uh, not trying, you succeeded, how mm-hmm. you, how you paid homage and showed your, I don't know if you're a comic book fan, but how you're, admiration for comic books through the way you shot this film and and the the, you know the themes and the topics you decide to bring up it i I really noticed the camera here and Mm -hmm. 
it felt like you were actually just like a person sitting in the room watching a lot of these like conversations happen. Yeah. Yep. And it kind of like, I think that might've added some of the awkwardness cause I'm like, I don't want to be here right now. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a really not good situation. There's that one point where Bruce Willis is like lifting all these paint cans and you are so close to the, the action and you're like, if he drops that, I'm going, my heart's going to jump into my throat. Like it's, it's just these really, close and uncomfortable encounters with these characters that you'd you'd rather as the camera be a little bit further away from yeah and i think the like the there's a lot of symbolism in the film so it's called unbreakable and it focuses on these two characters you have david dunn again appropriately named as a comic book character mm-hmm. with, the, with the first initial of his first name and last name being the same stanley always did that so that he can remember who was who peter parker bruce banner yep reed richards Clark Kent. Clark. Oh wait, no, <laughs> and he's DC. Yes, I know. <laughs> so David Dunn is supposed to be this guy who is—he's quite literally unbreakable. In theory, he's never been sick. He can't get injured. He's—you uh, know—he goes in train derails, and he's just fine. Not a scratch on him. Yeah, he's like Mr. Incredible, I guess. If you want to like, oh, Mr. Compare, Incredible, Mr. Incredible. Yeah, no. Compare like, like a strange. if you want to compare him to another superhero or. Uh, even Captain America, I would say, like in terms of like the skill set he has, in terms of like his he, his ability to not get injured or his his like superhuman strength. Captain America is a pretty close one. Yeah, I, I yeah. like that. And then uh, contrasting him, you have Elijah, who I can't remember his last name, but he calls him he's nicknamed Mister Glass by the kids because he lives with brittle bone syndrome, basically. Which, if you're you know trying to walk or if you like bump into something too hard, you're uh, there's like four levels of it and your bones will shatter. Like if you take a tumble down the stairs, it's not like a normal human being where like, ow, that hurts. You, He will be in the hospital for like a year or two while his all of his bones that have shattered falling down the stairs slowly remend. Yeah, like I, I actually know somebody with brittle bone syndrome and oh, shoot. They're, they're about a teenager now, but when they were a child, you know, they kicked a soccer ball once and broke their leg. Ay, yoy. Yeah, no, it's not a, it's not a fun time. So you can, you can, I mean, it's very obvious to you the contrast between these two individuals. You have one who is literally super, unbreakable, literally unbreakable, <laughs> one who is very breakable. Um, but the difference is that David, the one who is seemingly super powered, because we're not really sure through a lot of the movie, is very unsure of himself and he doesn't really know what's going on. He, he kind of, it seems like he has amnesia because he can't remember things from his life very well. Mm-hmm. Whereas, Elijah, despite being so fragile, is very confident and aware of who he is, and uh, it seems, remembers all the moments that happened to him. Yeah, right. he, like he seems to be very self-aware. So, and they do a good job of contrasting these people. David's often wearing green. Elijah's often wearing purple. Mm-hmm. And like I said, Elijah, he just dresses like a comic book character. He's got the long coats. He's got gloves. He's got you know things popping out of his shirt. I don't know what those uh, like scarfy things are yeah, called. Yeah, little ascots. I yeah, think. ascots. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He has a sense of style to him, like a suaveness. Yeah. And uh, I was and he just... really helps uh, Bruce Willis just come into his own. Like, it's it's not a, a overhanded guiding. It's just like, you know, you could do this. Like, you don't need to worry about this. Why don't you take these steps and see what happens? I made a joke when we were watching the movie. I said, oh, this explains how John McClane survived all those <laughs> Die Hard movies because he was in Unbreakable the whole time. Clearly, the, like, yeah, it's Bruce Willis is just too tough to kill yeah <laughs> i felt him kind of dull in the movie like i know that's basically the character he's trying to play as like this middle-aged guy who's just like you yeah, know just i don't know he felt like his character from 16 blocks I haven't uh, seen that movie okay really good he's trying to escort like this uh guy 16 blocks but the guy is going to be talking against this high profile weapons dealer so they try to get him killed but he's this retired cop and he's just like yeah like all right like Having a good day, like yeah, come down to LA, uh, have a few drinks. Uh, a few drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, uh, all right. <laughs> um, uh, we love you, Bruce. Yeah, <laughs> Honest Trailers released an Honest Trailer for Unbreakable this week. Oh, interesting. In preparation for, so I, I made sure to wait until after I watched the actual movie to watch the Honest Trailer. I am going to watch the Honest Trailer right after we're done recording this. I didn't want that to color my experience of the movie. Right, and they make a joke in the Honest Trailer. It's like. You know, as you're preparing for all these comic book movies of 2019, go back in time to when they were really slow paced. <laughs> and yeah, it's true. And I, again, like, yeah, I, yeah, I, that, that, it's just the reality. Like, there was a different time. And again, although I put fault on the first X Men movie, I have to 
be forgiving that that was a time when people weren't interested in seeing superhero movies as we do today. Mm -hmm. So they had to kind of tell these stories in a different way. Yeah, kind of hide them. Because it it certainly does come off more as like a psychological thriller. Like, I'm sure you could watch Unbreakable and like even ask the question, like, does he actually have abilities or is this... And he could not and it would still be a good movie. Like, it's one of those moments where the question adds a lot to the story. It's interesting because there is a video game that, that this happened to where the marketing was just... They, they couldn't market it the way they should have because of the audience. So in mm-hmm. America, there was a game called Earthbound that came out that was just this adventure RPG that was super weird and out there about kids with psychic powers. But the marketing in America, they didn't think that that would take because it was set, it was funny because it was set in like a 1990X America with like, you know, baseball and all that. Uh, so they marketed it as a uh you ever remember those gross out artwork cards from the 90s they're just like it's just over the top artwork like crazy bones yeah like crazy bones so they kind of did that marketing i was like this game is gross it's super gross you should play it the, the it was super weird but yeah one, once again like they should have just stuck with this is going to be a superhero movie come see it for this yes yeah, so i honestly think if this film came out now people would love it Oh, 100%. Because back then, there weren't really many stories that were... Well, there wasn't really a superhero genre at all. So the fact that this film came along de- deconstructing the superhero genre, it was kind of really pioneering and doing something that nobody else was doing. And mm-hmm. so in the culture... And, I mean, there's been lots of movies that have come out deconstructing the superhero genre. The Incredibles, Dark Knight, Watchmen. Like, you know, there's lots of examples of Kick-Ass. Like, there's all these movies that have, have done that. Right. But Unbreakable, I would say, is the pioneer. It was really the first one to do anything like this. Yeah, 100%. Like, there's a few definitely superhero movies back in the early 90s, but they they never really caught on. Like, I remember watching The Flash back in, like, 1997. That's a TV show. uh, What? No, no, there was a movie. There was a once-off movie uh, of The Flash where this guy, you know, after he runs, he has to eat, like, all this food and stuff. No. I'm, I'm willing to bet money that you're thinking of the Justice League of America TV pilot that included the Flash. I'm willing to bet money that is not the case. Okay. Five dollars. Five dollars. Okay. Five dollars. We're, we're shaking. We're shaking. We're shaking. We'll this look into happening. it afterwards. Alrighty. Um, but, but yeah, so it was pioneer of its ahead of its time. Yada yada. I think I've beat that over the horse. It has a lot of the classic M Night Shyamalan movie tropes. So like slow pacing, weird dialogue, uh, tense moments. Of course, there's a big twist at the end. He has a cameo appearance in the movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I didn't, I'm not a huge M. Night Shyamalan fan, so I've seen so few of his movies that I think this is actually probably the only one I've watched all the way through. Interesting. You haven't seen Signs? No. The Village? No. Interesting. Signs would be worth it. I didn't watch The Last Airbender either. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that that I can't fault you for. (laughs) Um, I, I had to laugh, though, because there, yeah, there's a couple scenes in a comic book store, and there's a couple of times where characters are holding comic books. And even though you see all the Spider-Mans and Daredevils and all the comic books on the shelf, all the ones that are actually like shown center on screen are like this off-brand kind of comic company. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. It's like called AC Comics instead Mm -hmm. of DC Comics. And actually, you know, the first time you see a comic book in the movie, it's upside down. And I actually thought it was an issue of Action Comics. And then the camera pan or turns around and you see it's, oh, it's it's Active Comics. (laughs) Oh, I see. So... Because it's it's stylized exactly like old action comics were. And there's this idea that Mr. Glass has of his emporium that of comic books as art. And it's kind of interesting because there's this idea of an M. Night Shyamalan movie being more of an artsy movie and his superhero genre being a pseudo hero genre in, in an art form. It's like superhero movies as art. Because this movie is a lot about the cinematography and the and the the slow creation of this character and this this artistic take on the heart of heroes just like mr glass's emporium is a take on the art uh the the comic book world and the morality of comic book worlds as art yeah and i and again the way they present mr glass in the movie he's like he runs this art studio where he basically has comic book art Mm -hmm. for sale and he does come off as kind of like one of those crazy comic book fans and i can totally see how again if you're if you're viewing this as a psychological thriller you and, and if you're in David's position, you'd be like, yeah, this is some weirdo that I need to like keep my distance from. Like at one point, someone wants to buy a comic book from the Emporium for his like seven year old son. And it's like a hundred and fifty dollar like original art print. And he's like, who are you buying this for? He's like, my son. He'll love it. It's like, 
get out of my store because because he knows that that seven-year-old won't appreciate the history uh, of this comic book it's like someone who buys like a vintage set of comic books rips them all up and use them as wallpaper like they're not appreciating the story behind it they just like the look of it we got to talk about spoilers because it's yeah. an M. Night Shyamalan movie. There's <laughs> oh, there's some great twists. All right, so spoiler world. We are entering the spoiler verse. Oh boy, the yeah. spoiler verse into the spoiler verse. I kind of like that. We should keep that as like uh, our yeah, thing. yeah. I like it. All right, so we are ent- into the spoiler verse. We go. I th- uh, I liked the idea that Elijah's mom wanted him to like not live inside. That she was trying to find ways to get him to actually go outside. Mm-hmm. So like every time she would put like boxes of comic books, it's like they're sitting outside in a bad neighborhood. If you don't get in to West them. Philadelphia, yeah, born and, and raised, raised. <laughs> uh, they make that joke in the honest trailer as well. Okay, good, good. Uh, and yeah, if he doesn't go and pick up those comic books outside, which he doesn't want to do because he'll get hurt, those comic books are going to get stolen. Yeah, I'd be curious to what the parents who listen to our podcast have to say. Like, is that a grid way to motivate your child to like you know live their life? Is by it's like you're offering them gifts for you know positive behavior, which you want them to do, but he is like in this very fragile health condition, like I guess he has to learn how to go outside to interact with humanity. Well, it's interesting because that's the opposite of what you would think modern parents would do. Because modern parents are like, oh my gosh, my kid has this disease. He is never leaving the house ever. They would be overprotective, whereas the mother wanted him to have a sense of agency, which I, I like better. Like, yes, you're sick, but, you know, like take certain precautions, but live your life. Like, uh, there's um, a guy I follow, Nicholas, I uh, can't remember, has no arms and legs, you know, um, and he lives the most incredible life. He's a, he's a Christian speaker, There's like an amazing lifestyle, and he should be having people help him with day-to-day tasks, but he has dedicated himself to working past his suffering and his weakness in order to live a more fulfilling life, and it's... It's interesting that like in modern times we tend to to baby things and be like oh you know don't don't overexert yourself and and it, it's this is horrible but at the same time it's so much more to try and push your, push yourself past your suffering and your weaknesses to live uh, a, a good life and a, a brave life. There's there's part of me as a comic book fan that is disappointed with how they explain he became a comic book fan. They basically suggest that, oh, because he was in hospital so much and because he was lying around so much that he was reading, he read so much, and that's why he's big in the comic books. Because See, I read a lot, and I can't I can't read comic books. It, it's so difficult for me to read comics. I don't well, know. so this is the thing. So it's saying, oh, like, it's it'd be abnormal. It'd be weird. He'd be a weirdo if he just, like, read a lot of comics because he wanted to. But, oh, it's like, oh, they have to come up with a reason for why <laughs> he would spend a lot of time reading comic books. And right. Adding in the other element of, oh, like he's an extremely fragile, uh, you know, weak individual. So, yes, we have, that would make sense why he'd want to read stories about characters who essentially are super, super powerful. Strong, right? so, now, this is interesting because a lot of people like Dragon Ball Z for that, that reason. They're, they did a lot of talk about, like, what kind of societies and what kind of people enjoy Dragon Ball Z for these super powered characters. And they found that often it was people who felt powerless in, in their station in life who enjoyed these characters who could go beyond their limitations. Man, it seems to keep coming back to this. Sorry. Yeah, and, and you know, I I get it. Like, those are obviously valid reasons for people to become comic book fans. But when you shoehorn it into the story, it doesn't fit. Or? Well, it's just you know, as a fan, I kind of felt like they had to like justify the reason that he would be a huge fan. It's like we can't just right. have him be a huge comic book fan because that. But hey, it was the two thousand. No one's a comic book fan. What are you talking about? Right. They, they didn't exist. No, that's a good point. <laughs> um, and so I, I was, but I, and that's the thing. So like, despite my like annoyance as like a fan, be like, oh, really? They got to do that? I also bought it. I was like, yeah, this makes a total valid explanation. It makes a totally valid explanation as to why he's this hardcore comic book guy. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was interesting that his mom essentially was like, like you said, kind of like the opposite of a modern day parent, like saying like, you need to be out there and no matter like the threat that's going to be there on your body, you got to get used to being in the world, which was yeah. pretty neat. Yeah. There was a, there was one moment in the movie where his son joseph mm-hmm. see I, I you know i like it when there's characters in movies with my name it, doesn't happen, <laughs> it happens less often than you would think and you can put it as your ringtone if you find the right sound bites yeah <laughs> so there's a moment in the movie where joseph is convinced that his father is a superhero right and so he pulls a gun on him oh uh, do, you, do you remember this part yes i do okay yeah and he's just like the bullet will bounce right off of you it'll be fine yeah oh yeah okay wow i totally forgot about that and what i Whew. thought what i thought was interesting is this is actually something that happened in the real world. To who? 
the uh, actor George Reeves, who he played Superman on the 1950s TV series. No way. So it's it's recounted in the film Hollywood Land, okay, wherein uh, George Reeves is played by Ben Affleck, mm-hmm. and basically the story goes that he was making a public appearance as Superman, and this child came up to him with a loaded gun and said, "Oh, can I shoot the bullet off of you so it can bounce off?" And oh George so Reeves happened? had to basically talk this kid down and, and use the kind of like a similar explanation here. Like, oh, well, if you do that, the bullet will bounce off me and hurt somebody else. Right. And so it's this very tense moment in that movie right. where he basically has to like talk this kid down. And the similar situation plays on this movie. Oh, my gosh. Wow. I, I can't help but wonder if they knew about that story and chose to basically incorporate it into the movie or if it's just a huge coincidence. Mm-hmm. That is amazing. Yeah, no, that was a tense moment. And then later on, I do love the uh, the paint can scene. It's just great. So at one point, uh, for our listeners who haven't seen it yet, um, uh, he is not only invulnerable, but he's also super strong. Uh, and super strong, like he's got a, every, what everyone had in their basements, which was a weightlifting set. And then he puts more weights on it and then he lifts it. And his son is a little bit further back because he's like, okay, if something goes wrong, go tell mom. And then they put more weights on it. And his son is even further back. And there was like, if anything goes wrong, go tell mom. And then they put like 600 pounds on this thing. And the kid is in the staircase ready to run in case he gets his ribs crushed in by the barbells. And it's just, there's so much comedy and joy in, in the moment where he just lifts it and then puts it back down. And he's just like, I can lift this. You know, I can lift. It was just such a fun sequence. Like, absolutely love it. Like that's a kind of tense moment, and, be, and the, you know they leave it ambiguous. Like they intentionally like that scene ends with him not getting shot. Yeah. So we don't actually know is he actually bulletproof? Is he actually bulletproof? Like he survived a train crash, but you know train crash is a lot of bouncing and 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 hitting things and glass. Like it's not the same as a bullet. Although some, if he got crushed by a train, definitely would be worse than a bullet. Uh, but yeah. yeah. There, there's a couple of times where Samuel L. Jackson's character, Mr. Glass, goes in these little like kind of like speeches about comic books. Mm-hmm. And I was getting worried because I, I've spoken before how there's that infamous scene in Kill Bill Volume 2 where uh, David Carradine's character just goes off trying like he's explaining his view of comic books and how Superman views humanity. And I was like, oh, this is just some pseudo philosophical like somebody who doesn't really understand the characters is just trying to like, you know, sound smart and talk about comic books. Right. And I was worried that Mr. Glass's kind of speeches would be in the same vein as that. But mm-hmm. no, like he, he brings up good commentary that, you know, would have been was reflected a lot in works that came out after this. So, yeah, I was thankful that that wasn't the case. The The whole concept of uh, David, the concept of David uh, working in the protection industry, because yeah. he just can't help doing that. And the fact that when he does decide to try and be a superhero, he puts on the green poncho. I was like... Dang, like ponchos make make a good uh, costume. You got the cape and the hood, and <laughs> yeah, it'll it'll keep your identity secret in the rain. <laughs> yeah, and the, the shadows look really cool. Like, there's one shot where he's at night in the rain, and you can't see his eyes because the shadow of his hat, but mm-hmm. you can see his lower. And it's like it's pretty much like he's wearing like a Batman mask or something. Yeah, he's, no, they they did a great job of that. The whole idea of having a weakness to water, though, that was, I felt that was kind of cringy. Um, it was thrown in a little haphazardly, but just like, well, no, there, well. Also at the same Superheroes time... Superheroes got to have a weakness. He's pushing himself to be convinced that he's not invulnerable. And he's like, see, I drowned. But it seems to me like it would have happened more often. And maybe showers would have been a little bit more dangerous for him. <laughs> <laughs> every morning he showers. He's like, man, I cut myself every time I shower and shave in the shower. This is the, the weirdest thing ever. Well, it's like, uh, you know, he falls in that pool. And that's like the moment where like, he might die. Yeah, and, and like the, the, the every parents fear the tarp that's over the pool slowly starts sinking into the water and he's he's like you know falling into it it's but i'm like is this really your weakness like all you have to do is learn to be a better swimmer and you're fine you can it weakens him (laughs) he tried swimming in the shower and didn't work at all the water just fell and he was (laughs) but is it actually like a weakness for him or is it just like a psychological weakness of his that's interesting it has to be a weakness of his because um he was almost pronounced dead when he drowned as a kid he could have just been like a really terrible swimmer at that point. Oh, yeah, 100%. But it got in his lungs. And though he may be invulnerable, he still needs air to breathe. So it's like, you know, does that mean he's not vulnerable to gas? If someone were to gas him, would he be uh, affected by that? Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I what was, did you think about Mr. Glass, spoiler, being the villain all along? Okay. So I knew that, like, what I did know about the movie is I knew that Samuel L. Jackson was the bad guy. Right. 
But the twist that is revealed right at the end of the movie that he is indeed responsible for all the accidents. Yeah. So there's so for for our audience, like there's a, a building burns to the ground. Six hundred people die. No one survives. Uh, you know, a train crash happens. Hundreds of people die. A plane crashes. Thousands of people die. No one survives. No one survives. And then suddenly there is that miraculous newspaper article. There is one survivor on this train crash, and he is miraculously unharmed. Yeah. So I and I I thought honestly like the movie was just playing at the thing that he was the villain because he's like trying to seduce David over to this like weird psychological side and mm-hmm. he's trying to like he comes off as a creeper, right? So yeah. it's like okay, I can see how he's the villain. But then when they reveal the twist that he was actually responsible for all the accidents, I was like, like wow, okay, that's a great twist. And of course, having lived th- through my little world of just experiencing an accident in Ottawa, it was kind of terrifying. It's like, imagine if there was somebody like orchestrating and pulling the strings. Yeah. yeah. Orchestrating these events. Cause like, this is like the, the bus accident that happened in Ottawa. That's the second one in the last five years. So, you know, uh, you, you, you get kind of scared. It's like, Oh, like sure. what if there is some kind of connection or intentionality behind these things? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that, that brought a like a little bit of real world kind of threat into, which I think um, if it strikes home, it's a better movie. Like that, that's a certain way that it's just like, yeah, he is a true villain, not with these cockamamie, the dog is going to bite this rope and it's going to drop a chandelier on you kind of way. But it's just like, I will instill terror upon your life, your livelihood where I may not injure you, but you will not feel safe. You will not feel comfortable. And I, I will take away from you the things that the, the comforts that make your life enjoyable in living. Like there's some crazy stuff going on. Yeah, so I was, I was genuinely surprised by that. Like I knew there was going to be a twist, but it, the, what the twist ended up being actually surprised me. So, good on you, movie. You, you, you did a good job, you, Shyamalan. You done, you done goofed me. Yeah. <laughs> the whole storyline with him and his wife kind of confused me. Like, I, it, there's just tension and, and problems. Like he probably wanted to divorce divorce her at one point. I don't know what their problem was. Yeah. But like, you know, he, he wasn't happy with his wife and that kind of shows it when he's taken off the ring to talk to this pretty girl at the beginning of the movie. Like, yeah, that was, I was not a fan of that moment. Well, but, yeah, exactly. But yeah, like this, the, it was like, I, I praised Bumblebee last week for like not straight out explaining, uh, what people, what people are, you know, how they're feeling. Like they actually go to the trouble of having subtext mm-hmm. but i feel like with this there was almost too much subtext because it had a hard time understanding what was going on mm-hmm. i i think it was more just like it's almost too yeah too little subtext in the sense like well his family life's not that important let's focus on him being a hero it's like yeah but the whole reason he was where he was is because his family life wasn't that good yeah so and the, the way the movie ends it just ends like all of a sudden he just walks away and they, they give you some information oh it's like, a very 2000s ending like it's just like yep that's the end of the movie guys like I was gonna. I was like expecting like some big superhero fight or something, and again, subverting my expectations, subverting the genre, and in, in, in a like more real world scenario, it's like once the villain's been revealed, like yeah, he just has to be arrested. There's gonna be a big battle. Yeah. So again, subverting my expectations. Very interesting. Uh, I I just really liked his ability. So uh, Bruce Willis has the ability to see people's negative actions, I think, not positive actions, uh, see their negative actions or their crimes or sins through touch. And it comes... He's basically like an empath almost. Yeah, yeah. So like if he passes by someone who's murdered someone, he gets a, a flash of, you know, what they've done. And there's this really intense moment where this guy has like killed this family and has kept their their, their younger kids uh, trapped in this house. And that's where this big battle kind of happens with one of the guys but it was just like man that that would be it's a really nice focus on the morality of superhero movies and why we fight it's like yes there is an objective right and wrong uh but it'd be interesting what the limits of his power would get to it's like what if someone did something wrong that wasn't technically lawless would he see it like you know if someone like if someone like sneezed in someone's face like would he see a, a thing of that right. or is it only criminal activity once he starts doing that kind of thing then you're you it's sort of susp- it's like okay he definitely has powers now because up until that point like even with the strength thing like there's just some people who are really insanely strong so, right but like once he starts having those kind of visions it's and like you know that they're correct because he's like i think that guy has a gun sure enough like it's it's not this just like sense thing like he knows and he sees it yeah you, you it becomes clear like yeah this this is for real. This guy really has powers. And so when he does go out and try to be a superhero, I'm like, yeah, I, do it, man. Do it. Do it. 
Be, um, be a man. Do the right thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that was that was interesting. And Philadelphia seems like a very scary place because there seems to be <laughs> lots of bad people there. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot, a lot of focus is superheroes. And uh, if you were born and raised in Philadelphia and had to move to Bel Air, there's probably still some problems going on there. Yeah. Oh, Philly. So coming around to final thoughts, you know, you have more of a history with Unbreakable than I do, Pixel. Uh, so let's yeah, it was one of those movies that just started uh, a great uh, series of like movies for me. Like I really enjoy Bruce Willis. I really enjoy his uh, the comedy that brought itself into the movie and the, the twists. And just I watch it every few years because it's such a, a nice sit down and reflective movie on something that I feel very strongly about, which is the morality of comic books. Uh, I was watching the um, 2009 Spider-Man series on Netflix. I, I can't remember. Maybe the Ultimate Spectacular Spider-Man? Spectacular Spider-Man or Ultimate Spider-Man. I can't remember which one. Oh, that one might be more recent. Uh, but it was interesting because most of the villains' uh, ideologies came from a grotesque feeding of uh some struggle that they were going through in terms of a a not a flaw but a um uh one of the seven deadly sins like uh the pride of octo octavius stopped him from seeing that the work that he was so proud of was going to injure people the uh gluttony of venom tied into like the gluttony that the character that he tied in with of like the envy to to overpower and to become the best like it's really interesting seeing how they are villains because they are not in control of their own um, interior. Um, not something when when you want food, you're hungry. You're uh, the drive. They're they're not in charge of their own drive. They are instead driven by uh, their weaknesses. So it, it's something that just I really enjoy seeing, and I I find is really reflective of our modern days. Like you don't become a villain because you choose to to be a villain you become a villain because you are no longer in your own control so how does that relate to your review of unbreakable <laughs> unbreakable is it is shows that? yeah it, it's uh bruce willis himself bec- becomes in control of who he is and learns who he is whereas a uh, mr glass becomes obsessed with the idea of finding this hero uh but goes about it in the wrong way and just hurts so many people to achieve his ends whereas uh bruce willis comes into himself uh, by accepting that he is virtuous and accepting that despite everything, he can do these good things. When, when I review these movies or give my like back cookie scores, it's mostly, it's not just evaluating the film on a technical level, but also my experience with it. So sometimes movies that aren't as good on a technical level, I'll give a higher score to because I just enjoyed them more. Mm-hmm. So this is going to be an instance where, you know, I'm probably going to give it a score that's lower than what people would expect, but that's partially influenced by my experience Mm -hmm. and that's me watching the movie for the first time in 2019 after seeing a whole bunch of other movies like chronicle like watchmen that that deconstructed the superhero genre for me and knowing that yes like technically unbreakable came out before those movies right right. um, but the watchmen comic came out in the mid 80s that doesn't and and that's fine because we have a modern audience yeah yeah so i would say yeah it's an excellent film it's definitely worth watching and i'm glad that M. Night Shyamalan decided to kind of move ahead and further develop this franchise. Um, apparently, people are calling it the East Rail 177 trilogy. Oh, because that's okay. the name, that's of, the the name train. of the train that he took. Interesting. And apparently, all the characters are involved in that somehow. So, I'm assuming the oh. guy from Split was involved in some way. Right. Uh, this, does, this movie does not make me want to go watch Split at nope, all. I'm, nope, ha- I'm happy nope. to just watch some kind of YouTube video that kind of like summarizes <laughs> I, the main I plot would happily points. avoid Split. But for Unbreakable itself, I'm glad I've seen it. Uh, Andrew Taylor, when he when we were talking about the best performances in superhero movies, he he made a comment saying that he felt Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson's performances. Uh, this is going back to like last June, but he really felt that those performances were worthy of being considered some of the best. And mm. after seeing the movie, I'm not quite on the same page as you there, but I will admit they're good. So I'll give the movie three point four. Oh, nice. Out of four back cookies. I was going to be, give it a 3.6 because, once again, like I'd have to rewatch it again. It's definitely not aged as well as it could, but it's aged pretty darn good. Yeah, and I'm obviously much more interested in Glass now that yeah. I've seen Unbreakable. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm interested to see how those fights work. Like, uh, Hopefully, they don't have too much of the, the split ridiculousness in there. <laughs> like, he's, he's a villain. But I'm curious to see how Mr. Glass kind of like twists things in his favor. There you go. So Unbreakable is now available on home video for you to watch or stream. Get I the VHS. It. Get the true experience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's available. Go go find it. Yeah. 
And it's time to go into the bat jar and look at our mail. Our clinkety clack. All right, we have mail this week from Andrew Taylor. Speaking of which, <laughs> all right, hey guys, uh, love that you're using the new song for your intro. Yeah, I actually really like it. Uh, sounds great. <laughs> I was very impressed with Pixel Patch's foghorn for the email. Oh, there you go. Foghorn for the email. That was epic. Made my day. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the the foghorn moment. I have a friend of mine who just did that way too much, and so I adopted it because that's what I do. Uh, I was recently watching an episode of Young Justice. Still have to watch that. And found out that... The, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please don't hurt me. I uh, found out that the DC Universe has a character called Black Spider. It basically seems like an evil Spider-Man. I get that certain characters from the Marvel are like copy of DC characters and vice versa. So Wizard is the Flash, Doctor Strange is Doctor Fate, Thanos, Darkseid, Fantastic, Elongated Man. Uh, but this one seems to be pretty much on the nose. What do you guys think this is? Is it good that these two companies copy each other and now we have more characters? Or should they have stuck to their own material? Cheers. Andrew. Thanks for that question, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, as far as, as long as DC and Marvel have been around, they've been ripping off each other's story ideas. So mm-hmm. Black Spider, especially for how small a role he has in, D- in Young Justice, the series, but also just DC, you know, <laughs> DC Comics in general. Yeah, he's pretty much presented as a Spider-Man knockoff. In fact, in Young Justice, he's voiced by Josh Keaton, who played Spider-Man in The Spectacular Spider-Man. So they, even with his casting in that show, they did a Spider-Man Easter egg reference. But I don't see the harm. It's, I mean, like Quicksilver and The Flash are pretty much very similar in terms, especially when it comes to the powers. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Well, for me, like it, it's like Wendy's and other fast food companies kind of like tearing at each other. It's just funny to watch from a distance. Like, I don't think anyone's livelihood is being ruined by it. Now, of course, someone's probably has. There always is. Uh, but it's more watching like two siblings having uh, like a, a scuffle with each other and just be like, hey, hey, we got this too. They're like, oh, you scamp, you rap scalawag. Like, of course you would do that. And then it's just kind of a back and forth. Whereas I think, you know, original characters have taken more of the uh, the spotlight, whereas a lot of the clone characters have kind of fallen to the side. So, you know, like they know that making original characters sometimes is better for them uh, than making these these clone characters. So... Yeah, and it's just, it's funny the way things pan out because Thanos was created to be essentially a ripoff of DC's Dark Side, mm-hmm. but because of the MCU, everyone, their mother knows who Thanos is and hardly anybody knows who Dark Side is. Yeah, exactly. And the same thing with Deadpool. He was made to be a more or less a, a, a copy of Deathstroke yeah. and just way things have gone, more people are way more familiar with Deadpool. Yeah, and the, the I think the comedy, the, the, the attempt of doing comedy while ripping off has made these comedic characters so beloved because they're just more ridiculous and people are, are enjoying them more. Yeah, and then, you know, I'm thinking of, like, you know, obviously like, there's characters who are very similar. So you have Hawkeye in Marvel Comics who's an archer, and you have in DC Comics Green Arrow who's an archer. Yeah. In terms of, like, their powers, their skill set, their weapons, they're very similar. And so it comes down to their personalities. Well, actually, they have a very similar jokey personality. And then it comes down to, okay, like, what's their background? And that's where they they, they actually start yeah, to be different. Yeah, like, and there's only so many powers that you can do with. Like, you know, like, uh, it's really interesting watching... Um, my Hero Academia, which is an anime about uh, superheroes, like there are certain characters that just have similar powers to each other because there's only so much you can do. But at the same time, the characters who are unique and powerful all have very, um, you know, you can only do so much with the superhero genre. Yeah. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with DC and Marvel kind of copying each other. I, it, and yeah. The obvious, like as we've said, the ones that are more popular will be the ones that stand the test of time. So. Yeah, exactly. So thanks, Andrew, for your email. And if you want to, uh, you Con- know, contact us or yeah. you know, send send a pigeon our way. We uh, sure. I I might eat the pigeon. You won't get it back, but uh, I'll be able to taste pigeon for the first time. So you will be contributing so much to us. Please don't actually send us a pigeon. Uh, so if you want to contact us or pigeon us with a question or idea for an episode, you will get. You know, definitely top spot if you pigeon us. Uh, you can send us an email to batjarpodcast at gmail.com. Or you can tweet with the pigeon at us at <laughs> the bat cookie jar. <laughs> <laughs> We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, Stitcher Radio, Spotify. Uh, so, Spotify and SoundCloud, once again, um, search for part of the name, the bat jar, or search it without like space bars. Once again, Spotify has a really weird search function that I've run into that 
Still not sure how to get around it. Or, you know, wherever you get your podcast, we're probably there. If we're not there, let hey, us know. Yeah, let us know. We It's just audio. We can we can add it anywhere we want. <laughs> it's not just audio, though. It's it's a great thing. Uh, so uh, share our posts on Facebook. Oh, and uh, make sure to like our page because it will make us show up in more people's feeds. And then we can feed more people. Yes, we love feeding people. Yeah, it's And great. we love having everyone join us inside. Inside the, the bat? Jar. Jar. Yeah. Jar. Apparently, we want pigeons and, and food in here as well, so why not? I, I think I'm just hungry. We need to have a buffet inside the bat jar. It's like, come to the bat buffet, the BB. Uh, gosh. Anyways. <laughs> All right. So next week, we're finally catching up on the nerd culture related films that have come out in 2018. Okay. We, uh, we're talking about Mary Poppins Returns. Ooh, do we have a guest for that yet? Well, we have, in fact, two guests. So whoa, whoa. They are, they're both ladies you've heard on our podcast before, but never together. Oh, so, together again. Yeah. So our uh, always joyful singing guest, uh, TC Laugh, will be back with us. All righty. Her first appearance since she got married. Nice, nice. To uh, our other guest, Dr. What? Dr. What? Dr. What? What? What, what? Okay. What, and what? our other uh, guest will be coming back will be Mama Poppins. Mama Poppins. Of course, you know, with a name inspired by the great Mary Poppins, it makes sense to have her on for that show as well. I'm so. very excited for that because I've seen the Mary Poppins movie. I was surprised by it. We'll, uh, okay. we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. So come back to the Batch Our Podcast next week when we talk about Mary Poppins Returns. Yep. And until that time, I'm Average Joe. I'm Pixel Patch. Catch on the flip side. One pixel at a time.